Well, good morning. My name is Chris Wells, and I am a leader here at Collective. Specifically, I am the tech coordinator. So this is a little bit of a different space for me. I'm typically uh, hiding in the back behind the soundboard, but have the opportunity to be up, up front this morning. And I am, I'm really honored to be here. This is actually the first time I've had the chance to preach at Collective. So huge shout out. Hey, thanks. Yeah. So yeah, big, big shout out to Pastor Michael for this opportunity. Uh, if this is your first time here at Collective, thanks for coming. We're, we're so pumped that you are here. Michael, our lead pastor, is enjoying his annual preaching break where he has the opportunity to refresh a little bit. But he, please know, like he isn't off just like chilling, sipping Mai Tais and things like that. Maybe a couple of them, but you know. Uh, he's actually working to continue to grow as a leader. He's dreaming, he's brainstorming about the future of this church and taking time off from preaching, it allows him to be able to listen to God in a little bit of a different way with a little bit of a different cadence. And he's been visiting some other churches who are a little ahead of where we are as a church and, and learning ways to continue to help collective grow at, at, to a, a church that truly makes a difference in our city. But nine years ago, my wife Maggie and I, we were living in Florida at the time when Michael came into town, all right? And at that point, I was a youth minister and she was a teacher and he came to our house and he said, guys, it's time. I'm starting a residency program where I'm going to be preparing to plant a church and I want you to move back to Maryland, which is where Maggie and I both grew up. And in classic Michael fashion, he said, you guys need to be a part of it. I don't know what you're still doing here in Florida. You have friends and family back home who don't know Jesus. Let's go. And at first we said no. But then a year later, we were packing our bags, uh, leaving our house, leaving our jobs, and moving back to Maryland to train and to prep to be a part of this church plant. And in May of 2016, we moved here to Frederick with Michael and Ray to be a part of what God had planned for Collective. And I, I got to tell you, there has not been a better journey to be a part of than what God has been doing in this church. And moving here, I never imagined the impact that this church would have, especially on my own life and my own faith, but also in the lives of so many of you here today and on our city but it's not, it's not just, uh, you know, the, the life change. It's, it's seen baptisms, right? Like baptisms. We've had over 150 baptisms so far in the life of this church. Yeah, give it up. That's huge. And those baptisms represent life change, right? They represent healing. And, and this, this church, this is a place where people are experiencing Jesus for the first time ever, where people are allowing God into their stories in ways that they never have before. Addictions are being broken, my own included. Marriages are being restored, my own included. Families are growing and there's generational change happening in, in my own family as well. So I want to encourage you, if you want to know more about what's been going on here at Collective or the lives of people here at Collective, go check out the Your Story Matters podcast, and, and you'll, you'll hear some really incredible stories of what God has been up to in the lives of people here at Collective. So again, if this is your first time here, it might be a little bit different today, and I know I'm not the usual preacher, but I want to encourage you to come back. So as CT said, we're in, our, in week four of our series, TLDR. And if you've missed it, or if this is your first week here, or if you have no idea what TLDR means, TLDR stands for Too Long Didn't Read. Now, I have to be honest, like, this is, this is my life. This is basically my life. Now, I've gotten better as I've gotten older, and I do like reading for the most part, but I am a skimmer at best. But in college, I was even worse, especially early in my college career when I didn't, didn't really know what I was doing with my life. In my freshman and sophomore years, I didn't read anything. But here's the thing. I didn't go to one of those big universities where you could sit in the back and you could blend in. And there's 50 plus students in your class. I went to college with Pastor Michael at a small Christian college uh, called 
Milligan College. It's in East Tennessee. It's now known as Milligan University. The, the school was so small that I remember in my sophomore year, we had a huge celebration, a huge party when the school broke 1,000 students of enrollment for the very first time. <laughs> 1,007 students. But the problem was in the first couple weeks of school, about two dozen students left and we were back, right back under 1,000, right? So being on a small campus, like you, you knew everybody but your professors knew you too. And most of the time you ended up having multiple classes with the same professor. And in my sophomore year, I had humanities with Dr. Craig Farmer. Uh, Dr. Farmer was an incredible professor, super intelligent, super patient as a teacher, but being the punk kid, punk college kid that I was, I did everything that I could to test that patience. And in humanities, we did a ton of reading, right? We read a lot of really great books like the Iliad and the Odyssey and Dante's Inferno or Adam Bede or Beowulf, among others. Well, I, I should say by we, I mean our, my classmates read these books, right? Because in order to read the books, you would have to buy the books. And uh, I didn't even pretend, guys. Like, I, I didn't even buy the books. So here we are. We're well into our semester, and Dr. Farmer knew my pattern. And I came to class, and he asked all of us to get our, get our books out. Uh, but I didn't have a book to get out. And uh, he, 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 looked, he, he looked at me and he just kind of stared for a second. I could literally hear him saying in his head, are you kidding me again? So he said, Mr. Wells, did you forget your book again? I said, no, sir, I, I didn't forget. I, I didn't buy it. He said, why not? I said, I didn't have any money to buy it. So being the great professor that he is, like he's, he's thinking, oh, this isn't terrible. He's just poor. So he pulls out his wallet. He gets out a $20 bill. He walks over to my desk and puts it down. And I was, I, honestly, I was caught off guard at first. And so I grabbed the $20 bill. I stared at it. And then I, I handed it back to him. And I said, I, sir, I, I can't take your money. I, I don't feel right about it. He said, he said, why not? Like, I'm giving you $20 so you can go and buy the book. I want you to be able to have the book. I said, no, no sir, I, I can't take your money. Well, why not, Mr. Wells? And I looked at him straight in the eyes and I said, because I won't use the money to buy the book, which is probably true because Taco Bell was really expensive back then too. <laughs> I'm also just really realizing that my parents are here and I've literally never heard that story before. So, <laughs> oops, sorry, mom and dad. Um, <laughs> Uh, I ended up having Dr. Farmer six or seven more times as a professor in college. And once I got my act together, he became one of my, my favorite professors in college. And I, and I definitely had to work really hard to earn a better reputation in his class. So, uh, so shout out real quick to Dr. Farmer, who probably will never listen to this, but just in case, you're the man. Thanks for putting up with my crap. Um, but really what I needed back then was the TLDR. The too long didn't read. Honestly, though, while I've gotten better at reading when I do read, I'm the type of reader that I've got to read something three or four times before it truly sinks in. Like I'll be reading and then like five pages later, I'm like, what the heck did I just read? Right. And I got to go back. So if that's you, if you're like me, then this series is for you. We're taking a look at some really cool stories in the Bible and pulling out some of the big ideas. And we're looking at some people that God used in some really unexpected and amazing ways just to change the world. And so today we're focusing on a guy named Timothy. Now, if you've heard of Timothy, it's probably because you recognize his name as two of the books of the Bible. But today we aren't necessarily just going to summarize those books because you actually learn a lot about Timothy from piecing together different snippets of the New Testament, not just from these two books. And I, I love the story of Timothy. And honestly, his story is really challenging for me. And the TLDRs, the main points that we're going to look at today, these are things that I am wrestling with. And as I was working on this message, these were the things that I needed to hear, the things that I needed to be challenged in. And so I hope uh, this, is, this hits for some of you as well today. But if you've opened a Bible before, you, you may have at least heard of Timothy because of the two books named after him. But unlike some of the other books of the Bible that are named after the authors of the book, these books weren't written by Timothy. These were two letters that were written to Timothy. 
These letters were written by the Apostle Paul, and Paul was one of the biggest church planners and evangelists in the Bible. Evangelist meaning his goal was to help spread the good news about Jesus and to help show people that Jesus is real and to show them that he really is the Messiah, the Savior, the one who came to save them and that, 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 that they can trust him. And Paul is responsible for writing about half of what we know as the New Testament. And Timothy traveled with Paul for much of his church planning career and became one of his most loved and trusted assistants. In 1st and 2nd Timothy, written specifically to Timothy, were two of Paul's last letters that he wrote at a time when Timothy was providing leadership at the church in Ephesus near the end of Paul's life. Now, in the Bible, we actually never hear Timothy speak. We don't, we don't see any quotes or anything from him, but Paul loved Timothy and wrote about him often. Check out some of the things that he said about him throughout his writing. In 1 Timothy 1, he said, I'm writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith. 1 Corinthians 4, he said, that's why I have sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you of how I follow Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 3, he is our brother and God's co-worker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. In Philippians 2, I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. Timothy has proved himself like a son with his father. He has served with me in preaching the good news. Timothy was like a son to Paul. See, he trusted him, he loved him. And Timothy became someone that Paul relied on to help grow the early church. Now, a little backstory here. Timothy was from the city of Lystra, which is in modern day Western Turkey, which was one of the cities that Paul visited during his first missionary journey between AD 46 and 48. And during these missionary journeys, Paul and his team, they would essentially travel around the Mediterranean and help uh, encourage and start local churches. They essentially planted churches. They would teach and they would train leaders in those communities to help the church continue to grow and continue to thrive once they left. And it was during that first visit to Lystra from Paul's team that Timothy, who was just 13 or 14 years old at the time, and his family, specifically his mother and his grandmother, they came to faith in Christ. And as Timothy grew in his faith, he became an influential leader even at a young age. And during this time, there was about a three-year period of growth that we see from Timothy. And the next time Paul and his team came through town, Paul noticed it. He saw it and he said, I got to take Timothy with me. He's got to come with me on my mission. And at this point, Timothy is still just a young teenager, about 16 years old. And it's believed that Timothy traveled with Paul and assisted Paul for the next 16 years. And Timothy may not be like the, the biggest name in the Bible, like, like that of like Moses or King David, like we heard about last week, or, or even Paul himself. But Timothy's impact on the early church and spreading Christianity should not be overlooked. Now, Timothy was raised by his parents and his, and his grandmother, though we don't know much about his father through the text of the Bible. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, he writes this, I remember your genuine faith, For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I know that same faith continues strong in you. So what we see here is Timothy's family passing down their faith to him. So here's the first thing, TLDR, parents, you need to set an example of faith for your kids. They need to see you making your faith a priority. Show them how important it is to be here, to show up to church. Let me ask you, do do you read your Bible? Do your kids know that you read your Bible? Do they know you pray? Do you practice these spiritual disciplines together as a family? See, Timothy was led into faith by his family and it led to him becoming a leader in the church. Now, as, as a dad, I got to be honest, like this scares the crap out of me, right? I've got four kids and I definitely know that I need to take this challenge for myself. And, and the longer that I've been a dad, the more that I realize what a huge responsibility this is. We've had four kids, our, our oldest, Sammy, who was already with Jesus in heaven. Jude is a loving six-year-old boy who is absolutely hilarious, 
And there's, there's Daniel, who is, who is so smart, and he's so sweet, but he is a literal bull of a human <laughs> at three years old. And then there's Raymond, who is a straight-up savage at 22 months old, right? But God has literally entrusted these kids to me and my wife. We are in charge of introducing them to Jesus. And they already ask so many questions about God and faith. And, and a lot of it's because their older brother is already in heaven with Jesus. And so we get questions and, and it's like, Dad, when can I go to heaven like Sammy? Dad, what are Jesus and Sammy doing today? Dad, does everybody get to go to heaven? And, and it's always followed with why, 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 Dad, why? And honestly, like that can be super intimidating. But as a father, like I get to point them to Jesus. Collective Kids is incredible. Here, I love what they learn back there. And if you serve in Collective Kids, like huge shout out to you for what you do, right? Like I literally could not do what you do. Kids are crazy, okay? Uh, but, but my kids and so many other kids are better and they're hearing about Jesus because of what you do. But as Bethany, our, our kids director, has pointed out so many times, she, like, they only get so much time with our kids. It's a very limited amount of time. And they should just be supplementing what we as parents are doing to show our kids Jesus. There's an app that Collective Kids uses. It's called Parent Q. And if you don't have it, I highly, highly encourage you to download it. It is incredible. It's the best. It has videos from the lessons that they learned back there. It has the memory verses, has worship songs, it has, it has things that me as a, as a dad and my wife, that we can talk with our kids about during the day or during the week. There's things for the morning and at, at bedtime or bath time. And it's, it's really incredible. This app is awesome. But it also is the worst. Let me tell you why. This is what pops up when I open the app, right? Which is super cute. He's got all, all three kids here. But like, seriously, it, look what it says at the very top. Jude Wells, 583 weeks until they move on to what's next. Like, that's terrifying, right? Until they move on to what's next. Like, that's the worst. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh. And, and look at that. Look at the green around the circle. It's like a ticking time bomb, right? right? It's like a third of it is already gone. And my son's only six. He's only six, and a third of it is already gone. That's, that scares me. And like, I want my boys to follow Jesus. I want, them, I want them to know Jesus because of how I know Jesus, but I want them to want to follow Jesus because of what they see in my faith. And I, I, like, guys, I know, I know what Jesus has done in my life, the healing, the restoration, and the, and the purpose that, that Jesus has brought to my life. And I want my kids to experience that. I don't want my kids to have the same struggles that I have had. I, I, I know firsthand what a real relationship with Jesus can do, and I want that for them so badly. Timothy had that modeled for him, and that left a lasting impact on him. So even when he was young, he was given a critical role in the early church. And Timothy literally helped people come to know Jesus. And, and I want that for my kids too. Parents, I, I don't know about you, but uh, there is nothing that I want more than to be able to watch the impact that my kids' faith can have on the world and on the church. I want to see them get in that trough and get baptized one day. But I know that starts now with my example and yes, that's super intimidating, but it's so important. Our next TLDR that I think we can learn from the life of Timothy also happens to be one of our values here at Collective. So TLDR, be rooted in truth. Towards the end of his second letter to Timothy, Paul has given him a charge. And he says this in chapter three. He says, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. But the reason that Paul is pushing Timothy so hard here is because he was working in Ephesus to undo and correct some of the false teachings that was going on there at the time. You see, Ephesus was a culture that was deeply rooted in idolatry. 
And one of the main gods in Ephesus was Artemis, the goddess of the wilderness and fertility. And she was so ingrained in the culture and society at that time. Like businesses were built around Artemis. Like blacksmiths built statues and everything for this, for this god. And so this new Jesus, this new Jesus thing that came around, like it threatened a way of life. It threatened the society and the businesses of that culture. And so the Ephesians, like they were so caught up in this and so caught up in themselves in their own culture that it made it really challenging for the early church in Ephesus to break that cycle. And so Timothy had to stay rooted. He had to stay rooted in the truth of the scriptures and the teachings of Jesus in order to weed out the things that weren't true. And so for us, like we need to be invested in the truth. Spend time daily reading your Bible. Michael often reminds us uh, that people who read their Bibles at least four times a week statistically are less depressed. Statistically, they're less likely to struggle with things like pornography or addiction. There's less divorce in those marriages. The doing the simple things in our faith is so important to staying grounded. So read your Bible. And like, I, like honestly, like I need this reminder every single day. Like I have alerts that pop up on my phone. I do plans on the YouVersion Bible app and I still miss days. Like it's in my pocket, I have it and I still miss it. A day will go by, a week will go by and then I'll be anxious and I'll be stressed out at work and, and then an alert will pop up on my phone and I'm like, oh, right. I literally have not spent any time with God this week. No wonder I'm stressed, no wonder I'm anxious. Or be here, show up on Sundays where you can hear sermons that are rooted in truth. And these things seem small, but they help us stay grounded because there is so much negativity all around us every single day that are dragging us down. Things happening in the world. Like it's, it's no wonder that mental illness and people are struggling with that at an all time high rate. Clinical depression diagnoses are up 10% in adults since 2015. Social media, television, everything, it's, it's constantly berating us with things that are not rooted in truth. So we have to stay rooted in truth. Our next TLDR is probably the one that I love the most about Timothy. So TLDR, find people to be in your corner. Now, I love the relationship we get to see between Paul and Timothy Paul spends so much time encouraging and challenging Timothy to be the best leader and man that he can be. Now, I've been really, really lucky in my life. I've been really thankful to have a really, really solid mentors and solid family and solid friends who pushed me in my faith. And they've held me accountable and they've also held me up when I've needed it the most. Now, that hasn't always been an easy thing. It comes with very challenging and very hard conversations. Pastor Michael and I, CT, who is our host today, and some other men in this church have, have been a part of some of the hardest conversations that I've ever had in my life. And at times, like, that sucked. It's been really, really hard. Like, I have, I have lied. I have cheated. I've manipulated, sometimes directly to those guys. CT, who preaches here from time to time, if you've been here a while or you've heard one of his messages, you may have heard him say, like, friends stab you in the front. And these guys do that. They do that for me. They've let me have it, but I know that they're in my corner. Listen to these words from Paul in 1 Timothy 6. It says, but you, Timothy, are a man of God, so run from all these evil things, pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you. Jumping down to verse 20, to, he says, Timothy, guard what God has entrusted to you. Now, I'm a words of affirmation guy. Like that's my, that's my love language, right? That sticks and stones phrase, completely false. Right? Like words literally have the ability to destroy my soul, but they also have the power to build me up. But I, I love the balance that we see here from Paul. Like there's care and love in these words, but there's also challenge. And I, I really think that's the best type of relationship to have. Care, love, challenge. Find people to be in your corner. If you're searching for that, the church is a really, really great place to start. Check the box to join the team or join a collective, which is one of our small groups this fall. 
where you can be surrounded by other people who are trying to figure it out too. Lastly, TLDR, God can use you no matter your circumstance. Timothy was young. He came from a biracial home that we know his his mother was a Jew and we know his father was a Greek. And at that time, that definitely would have presented challenges for Timothy. And the Bible talks about his mother coming to faith, but it never mentions his father coming to faith, which also would have been challenging. But Paul challenged Timothy in these situations. He encouraged him not to let others look down on him because he is young. So students, let me talk to you for a second. Students, you matter. Your faith matters. Timothy started out when he was young, but just because he was young, he didn't allow it to stop his his growth as a leader. Get involved in Youth Collective. DJ, our youth director, is crushing it right now as our youth director. He just got back from a week uh, with some middle schoolers at Christ in Youth. You know, there's so many things for you guys to get involved in. And from being a youth minister for six years myself, I can tell you that these are some of the most important years for your faith. If you can start like a relationship with Jesus now, then I promise you it'll set up your life way better than it would otherwise. I mean, students, like look around this room for a second. You're you're in here, you know, all the time and you hear the stories. You hear the stories about us adults. Adults, back me up here. Like, Like students, you don't want to play catch up like so many of us have had to do in our life, in our faith. I guarantee you that so many of these adults wish that they had had an opportunity to get involved like you guys have right now. And I love seeing students join the team, it's really cool. Don't wait, like your faith matters now just as much as it will when you get older. Michael shared with us a few weeks ago that one of the greatest factors that will impact whether or not you continue to follow Jesus as an adult is how involved you are in church now and how consistent you are in attending. We just got to celebrate last week the baptism of a student, which is awesome. Students, we we love you. Be here. Timothy also seemed to struggle with confidence and he was timid at times. In fact, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he basically told them in his letter, like, don't steamroll Timothy. He said in 1 Corinthians 16, when Timothy comes, don't intimidate him. He's doing the Lord's work just as I am. So Timothy, he clearly didn't start out as the leader that he grew to be. Like that took time, that took mentorship. It took chances and opportunities to grow into the man that he became to be. And there's many times throughout the New Testament where Paul issues these challenges to him to continue to step up as a leader. And in Timothy's life, like I wonder if he imagined if he would be in the positions that he was put in. Like despite all the things, being young, lacking confidence, he he eventually was commissioned by Paul and other church leaders to go and visit the church of Ephesus and be a leader there. And as I mentioned before, like Ephesus was going through struggles. They were having difficulties, but it was Timothy who was chosen to lead through that. And in the church world, ministers and pastors can become ordained. Uh, This means that they're commissioned by a group of church leaders or elders to be sent out to do ministry in the name of Jesus. And one of the phrases uh, when you're ordained is that's used is sometimes is that you become a Timothy of that church, right? You're, You're sent out just as Timothy was sent out. And a a long time ago, this this was me. As I said, I went to college with Pastor Michael and I studied ministry. And coming out of college, I went into youth ministry for six years. But prior to heading out, I was ordained by my home church, Mountain Christian Church in Joppa, Maryland. And I was challenged and then I was sent out as a Timothy. And, And good things were happening. People were coming to know Jesus. We served the community and we started leading trips to Haiti to help start churches and and plant churches. Students were getting baptized and growing in their faith. But man, was it hard. Full-time ministry can be brutal. It can take a toll on you and your family. I was a young 22-year-old, just graduated college, expected to lead students who are just four years younger than me. And, And while I was sent out as a Timothy, Like I struggled and honestly, like while I worked hard to be a good leader, I I sacrificed my marriage for it at times and my, my greatest weaknesses got exposed. I spent time in the Bible as a job, not for myself. And so I stopped being rooted in truth. 
I stopped allowing the people in my corner to push me. And I think that's why this story of Timothy like hits me so much. You see, because of these things, like I slowly started heading down an extremely dangerous path that led to addiction gripping my life, to secrets, to affairs. And ultimately it took me out of ministry. TLDR, go listen to the Your Story Matters podcast where my wife and I had an opportunity to share our story. But after nine years in ministry, it was actually the weekend that I was supposed to preach at Collective for the very first time almost six years ago. And my sin came to light. It all came out. My addiction had taken its toll on my life. And I left ministry. I moved back home with my parents, separating from my wife and my one-year-old son. And that was it. I had literally lost what mattered most to me in my life. It was awful. It was the darkest period of my life, feeling like such a failure, knocking on my parents' door, hoping that they would take me in when they had no clue that I was an addict or that anything was going on in my life at all. Having no job and not being able to find one, I I literally applied for like 50 jobs here in Frederick before finally asking my father if I could come work for him at at his car dealership an hour and a half away. It was rock bottom, darkness. And honestly, like I just sat in it for a while. And it wasn't until several months later that I got help and I got into therapy and I slowly began the road to recovery and restoration in my marriage and in my friendships. But that still led to like several years of losing faith that God could use me and my circumstances for good. But by the grace of God and honestly, like how he used this church, that circumstance and that darkness has been made new. And if you're here checking out this church or if you're new to this whole Jesus thing, like I wanna tell you, there's not another church like this. This is truly a place where you can show up with your mess, with your brokenness, show up with your questions and you'll find other people who are working hard to find that healing too. But you need to know where that comes from, that that peace, that healing, that restoration in your marriage, in your friendships, that freedom from the addiction can only come from a relationship with Jesus and allowing him into the center of all of it where he can begin to reshape everything. Timothy was charged with sharing that good news that only Jesus offers. And that led to people putting their faith in Jesus. So if that is you today, if you are searching for that type of healing, that type of joy and peace in your life, I want to encourage you to check the baptism box on your connection card, and we will follow up with you this week. This church is full of people that God has done way more with their circumstances than they could have ever imagined, myself included. And when it all hit the fan six years ago, like I honestly thought, it was all over, all of it. I I never thought that I would ever get the honor to do something like this again. But God is way, way bigger than all of that. He is bigger than my circumstances. He can use you no matter where you are in your life. And all you have to do is open yourself up to him. So let me ask you, what can God use you to do? If God can use me and you, no matter the circumstance, then in what ways can God use you? Can you be the first to break generational sin in your family, addiction, abuse, or neglect? Men, can you step up and be the spiritual leader in your house that your wife and your kids are begging you to be? Can you be the one to prioritize getting here on a Sunday or or go first and get baptized like Scott Leeser did a few weeks ago in his family? What would, work, what would your workplace or your company look like if you allowed your faith to influence the way you led or served in your organization? Or, or do you even have the guts to let people at work know that you're a Christian? Like, I gotta be honest, like this was a new one for me, right? I, I worked in ministry for 10 years, so that was easy. But now like when my coworkers ask where I went to college or what my degree is in, Try telling your coworkers at Northrop Grumman, a major defense contractor, that you have a Bible degree, right? And they're sitting there with their degrees in engineering or project management or business. It's intimidating. But guess what? I invited some of them here today. 
Can you be the one that invites your neighbors to church or, or in, in forever changes the trajectory of a friend or a family forever? Or maybe this is your first time here today and, and you're wrestling with this question, like, can God even use me? What is God's role? What is his place in my life? Why am I even here right now? God wants you. He wants you to let him use you in your life. He wants you to let him into your life where you can find peace and hope and purpose and community and hope. And maybe for you, it's simply just showing up again next week or and maybe bringing somebody with you next week or coming back in a few weeks and coming to the grocery store buyout. Teenagers, can you become a leader in your schools, in your class or your teams, just as Timothy did? God can use you. He can use you. He used Timothy, a young boy, who allowed Jesus to transform his life. And he became a huge leader for Christ. Imagine what God can do through you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the life of Timothy. I think as we read the Bible, it's, it's really easy sometimes to just gloss over the names uh, but there's so much that we can learn from this, this story. You know, I, 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 I want to be a man like Timothy, who despite his circumstances, like fought for his faith and became an incredible leader in the church. And God, like, I, I believe that can be us today. So many of us don't believe that you can use us or that we don't deserve it, that we're too young or too broken or too messed up. But God, you take us as we are. And you can do way, way more through us than we can do on our own. But God, help us open ourselves up to you so we can be a part of what you're doing. God, we can't wait to see what you do. In Jesus' name, amen.